Welcome to Through the Forest. Each week we're going to review a section of scripture, determine what the word says about how we can be better parents. Let's get started with the weekly word with our hosts, Jeff and Brent. Well, hey everybody, welcome to Through the Forest. Uh, We're excited to be with you again here today. My name is Jeff Kammerer. I'm one of the hosts here and I'm joined by Brett Snyder. And I'm going to turn it over to Brett and allow him to just say a quick word of prayer for us as we get ready to start. Thanks, Jeff. It's great to be here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you with humble hearts, Lord, with hearts that are open uh, to receive your word, to receive instruction, to receive advice, Lord. And Father, again, we're thankful for the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for the salvation you've given us through the, the, the shed blood of Jesus. And Lord, we just pray that the things discussed today and the people we talk to, Lord, uh, will just be a blessing to others and encourage them and, and provide them insights into being better parents and better grandparents and just being uh, better members of the family. And Lord, again, we just pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're continuing through Colossians here today, and we are at the back end of Colossians chapter 2, and so we're going to be kind of focusing in our study here in the beginning on verses 16 through 23, and um, this is kind of a a difficult section a little bit to pull out some some parenting principles and um but we're gonna we're gonna do the best we can so i'm gonna turn it over to to brett and kind of see what his thoughts are on these verses (laughs) yeah jeff uh these scriptures are certainly really really powerful especially about individuals following after the lord and particularly with respect to the influence of others right and and the influence of others can be, I don't know, you, I mean, sure, you can testify to this. It, it, it can be so impactful. And as parents, we have to be really careful. We have to guard that door of influence carefully. Uh, not just the influence in our children. Of course, we need to be vigilant there. But, but even how uh, influence impacts us as parents. You know, it's, that's interesting about influence because I, I think it can be tough to know how to do that, how to guard the influence of, of your kids. You know, we're wrestling with that a little bit right now as, as parents. You know, when kids get into upper elementary school, that is all of a sudden it becomes like this high level need, the need for friendships at that age from you know, eight to 12, somewhere in in that range and and friendships become so important and you know and so we're we're kind of just entering in that that realm and so if anyone has as advice i'd love to hear how you kind of wrestle with that because we don't know sometimes how strict we're supposed to be with who I allow my kids to be friends with. You know, I, 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 I'd hate to, to be the parent that tells you cannot be friends with, with that person. It doesn't sound like a, like a, a statement that Jesus would, would make, you know, in, in terms of loving other people. But, you know, we just know the, the power of, of influence. And, you know, there's, there's just all kinds of other layers that make it real challenging. I was actually talking to my daughter last week and, you know, we were talking about, friendships and and influence that people can have and what are the difficult things and concepts that I'm I'm guess going to have to teach her and as she gets older is just this idea that just because someone goes to church it doesn't really mean that they're a follower of Christ and it, it's just it's just a challenging thing to to have to consider and and put in front but because that's the influence that you want your your kids to to pursue and desire it's one of the things that I'm praying for that they'll have a, a desire and passion to to form friendships with people that are encouraging in their faith and supporting them in their faith and so if anyone is able to offer any words of, of wisdom or suggestion. I am all ears <laughs> we as we kind of start it. navigating the <laughs> world. Yeah, you know, uh, this influence, as I kind of even prefaced earlier, it's, it's an influence of, of our children and how do we put up those guardrails. And again, even, even the influence of other grown-ups giving us advice. You know, advice can be well-meaning, right? And many times the input and advice that we receive for parenting 
it, it can be earthly minded many times, maybe culturally based and, uh, you know, you know, in alignment with our day and age and, and, and these times and these seasons. And many times this earthly minded advice is, is not attainable or sustainable uh, in our own family dynamics and, and makeup. And then, you know, what sadly what happens when we don't measure up to these impossible standards well, then guess what? Many people begin to condemn us, right? They, they begin uh, to, to look, look down on us because we're not being, quote, spiritual enough, right? And, and as parents, we can really get discouraged by that. We, we simply just throw in the towel, we give up, and thinking that we're never going to measure up to these impossible ideals and standards. And then sadly, they give up entirely and then they cease pursuing all aspects of leading their family and their homes in a godly manner. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting here in, in Colossians 2, verses 16 and 18, said twice, don't let anyone condemn you. Jeff, I'm sure you've come across a discouraged mom or dad um, who's been feeling scorned, either uh, actually or maybe in their own perception from others about how they appear to be falling short of being the super mom or the super dad. How did you go about encouraging them? Yeah, I think that, I think one of the, the first things that's important probably is, um, is being aware of who is discouraged. I, I haven't had a whole lot of parents come up to me with this feeling of discouragement. It's almost been like, I've have, I've had to, seek it out. I've had to identify and say, hey, hey, you know, it's okay. It, it's okay that you're struggling in, in this area. Um, but there's so many stories of, of people that I've walked alongside of that have kind of seemed like they were the perfect and ideal family and, and how there are so many things behind the scenes that so many people don't realize that that this family is struggling in in so many different areas and it's so i think it's so easy to portray that we have it all together that we have all the answers and there's so many people that just simply don't and so if you're in a position where you're struggling well guess what jo join the club i mean all of us are are in some in some areas struggling whether it's in in our marriage or just in our our personal relationships with our with our family and so maybe it's not just this big family thing but maybe it's just you and one member of your your family like one of your children you're just you just keep butting heads and um there's all kinds of different areas where people can can struggle and so just understanding and and knowing that there's no set normal standard that you need to jump up to i, I think is critical i think we have to understand that no one is displaying to us a perfect family unit. And so any vision that you get from anyone else is going to continually fall short. You know, when I was when I was looking at the the text, my my mind kind of went right in between those two verses, Brett to verse 17, which talks about the religious rites that the people were doing that they intended the the actions of these things to bring them in better connection to god and what paul does is he describes those things as they're just a shadow of the things to come they're just there's just a little glimpse of the things to come and i, I started thinking how easy it is to live in the moment and and not think about the eternal uh, marriage and family are are human institutions and the, the scripture says in, in heaven we're not going to be given in marriage so even though there's great importance in tending to our marriages and families now really it's designed to give us a glimpse of what's to come oh, that's really great feedback i I've, I've taken business trips in the past and i've heard this analogy that you know with regards to these are just a, a glimpse they're a shadow it would be the same as me coming back from a, a business trip and I come in through the front door and the kids come running to me saying, daddy. And then they start bending down on the floor and kissing my shadow when I'm actually here. Right. It just doesn't make any sense. And it's just neat to know 
uh, that, that Jesus is, is a greater reality for us. It, you know, we're, we're living in this, in this age of the new covenant, right? It's, you know, we, we, have, we have Jesus. We no longer have these shadows, these things that point. And I also, I like your answer as well, too, that if anyone does condemn us, chances are they don't have it all together themselves either. The reality is they're, they're, they're people just like us. So whatever, we, we don't be discouraged because we're all sort of in that same rowboat together. And, uh, you know, I, I've heard it well said, Jeff, the, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. You know, doing spiritual things for the sake of just doing them is 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 an approach that that, that we should encur- you know that we that we shouldn't encourage right it's just you know if they're just going through the motions you know that's that's nothing that we should encourage at all never even in our own lives and our own devotional lives and and certainly not in the lives of those little ones that are entrusted to our care you know i've come across and i've noticed that exclusive focus on external rules and disciplines tend to miss the target of modifying the heart just as we kind of talked about, right? If we're just all about these shadow things, but we're not getting to the reality, uh, you know, which is the heart is, you know, is gonna, we're going to fall short. And I'm reminded of Jesus speaking to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 27, 28, where he's describing these Pharisees as being whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they're all spiffed up and cleaned up and painted, but on the inside, they're dead man's bones, right? <laughs> and then furthermore, in Colossians uh, uh, 2.23, uh, the, the last part of that verse, it says, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. So all these rules and regiments, um, they're disciplines, and they should be there. If they weren't, it would not be good either. But we just have to, they're not the exclusive thing we should be focused on. I mean, let me be clear. We absolutely need to deploy uh, biblical, godly, spiritual disciplines. For example, like reading his word every day. I mean, Hebrews 4.12 even mentions that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. It, it divides the soul of spirit. And I love it how it says in the old King James, it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And, you know, so, so how is this accomplished? Well, you know, you know, I think that one of the key secrets is meditation. I, I, recently, I was, I was doing some Bible study and I, and I came across the word meditate and the Hebrew word that's associated with the word meditate is, is filled with all kinds of illustrative terms and definitions. Uh, to speak, like to utter and to mutter, uh, to imagine, uh, to study it. And one of my favorites, which was an incredible discovery, is to roar like a lion. Uh, you can read it yourselves, but Isaiah 31, 4, it, dis- it uses this word in talking about a lion that is roaring over its prey, its food. And with it, it has this, maybe we've come across a, maybe trying to take a a toy from a dog or maybe a bone from a dog and they're growling, you know, they, there's, there's really passion and possessiveness over this object and it makes them fearless too. Maybe a, a, a yelling would scare away a lion or, you know, a scolding of the dog and it would back away. But when you're trying to get that bone from them, it's like all of a sudden they have this courage and this bravery and no matter what you do, how, how, how much you come after them, they're not going to let go. And, it, and this, is, this is meditation. So, you know, just incredible words that, of avenues to, a, to the heart of a person. The saying, the visualization, the academic, the thinking, and of course, the emotion and the passion. All these different avenues that get to a heart. You know, and as parents, you know, we, do, we need to install godly disciplines for sure. But can we stay vigilant? It, with cultivating uh, a heart for the Lord, maybe through these different avenues. Jeff, you know, knowing that meditation is such a rich word, as I described, um, you know, what approaches perhaps have, have you taken to foster meditation perhaps in your own life and maybe in the lives of some of your, your younger ones? Well, the approaches are certainly different for, for us. I mean, I kind of almost view meditation as the, the process of 
just a continual reflecting on God, reflecting on his truths, just thinking about him, like letting those things just pour over your, your mind so that they in turn can infect and uh, affect your behaviors. And so for me, meditation becomes just pausing and being still and, and having times where you're, you're reading the word and then you're just sitting to reflect on it and think about what you've, you've read. And there've been so many times when I've, I've read through a scripture and, and felt like I've, I've rushed through it or, or felt like I, I just did not process it enough. And I've just revisited and, and gone back and let me just read that again. And, um, and sometimes it's, it's a repeated pattern. Let me go again. Let me go again. Let me go again. Just continually reading it and, and trying to to understand what this text is is saying, and you know, I'm, if I'm thinking about that type of behavior from my my family's perspective, I think that there would be a lot of yelling. Um, hey, quiet down! We're smoke. We're, we're doing our meditation time here, and I don't think it would. I don't think it would work quite quite as well. Um, be a lot of fruit there. So for our family time, I think meditation on, almost becomes um, repetition. So that, that's what that's what kind of we've em, employed is is not sitting and reflecting. It's just I'm going to continue to review the aspects of God's character through His Word. We're just going to go through it. There's been so many devotions where we've just gone through it again. We've gone through it again. We do the same thing over and over again. We have the same uh, routine every every Christmas. We read the same through Advent verses, the same the same book. We're doing over and over and over again. And so I think. For, for us and our family, that's been our form of meditation. There have been so many times that my kids have helped me tell the stories. We're reading the stories out of the, out of the Bible and my kids are like voicing along. And a lot of it is because they've heard this story so many times, whether it's home or a lot of times it's they're hearing it at church. And so meditation then becomes, okay, well, what is this what does this passage actually mean? Do you know the details? Do you know the purpose? Do you know why this person said this or or did this or, or why does God act this way? And so I think it's just a constant question and evaluation of what the scripture actually means. And so for, for our family, it maybe it looks a little bit different than it does for um, my own personal time in in meditation and you know, one of the things that I'm really trying to determine how to teach my kids is the truth that I, I can see in verse 20. You know, Paul's asking the church, if you died to the principles of the world, why are you still trying to live by them? And I feel like this question, there's such a there's such a balance that we need to figure out how to to strike well because I, I don't want to be in a position where um using my child's profession of faith as a almost like a behavior modification like i want you to to do this thing because this thing that i'm instructing you it's it's you being obedient to to me ultimately it's it's them being obedient to christ but it's hard to, i think sometimes to get to that point and i think it could eventually be exhausting to our kids if we continually do this because I know that I wouldn't want someone criticizing every single mistake that that I made and, and pointing out all of my sins and and not even being critical that I made a mistake but like hey you're letting God down hey you disappointed God hey that's not something God wants you to do but at the same time there are behavior patterns that we do need to address and we would need to address them because well maybe our kids are believers and we need to from a discipleship perspective we need to be introducing them and letting them know that these things are not good that they're not right and so I, I guess one of the things that I'm hoping to to do my biggest strategy I feel like as the, my kids get older will be to enlist the help of others you know find people that can pour truth into them that don't have the the parenting role of rule formation and and uh, in in those 
terms, but that can be actually pouring truth in them from a discipleship perspective and saying, hey, this is not what God expects. This is not what God wants. And then almost be enhancing what then we're telling them at, at home. But I'm curious, Brett, if you have any other suggestions about that. Oh, you've you've mentioned a key one earlier, even what I, I've been doing recently with some of my younger kids. Uh, you know, they're they're very involved in Bible memorization and uh, through Awanas and, uh, and and they achieve so much. The, the capacity for them to memorize just continues to astound me. It really is. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm losing the synapses, no doubt about it. I'm blaming it on my old football you know, career in the past. But no. Um, but, you know, it, it was. Uh, we've been giving pause as they recite their, their memory verse. And then I would say, so what does this mean? And all of a sudden, sort of the blank stare, like, I really don't know what it means. <laughs> all right, let's talk about it. And, you know, we were going through, uh, you know, listening to the, the book of Genesis and giving pause. And, you know, you bring up the part of, you know, some people who say they're Christians, but maybe their behavior isn't good. You know, we're going through the whole story about Jacob, you know, favoring his son, Joseph, and of course, making his other sons mad. And, you know, they were all believers. They're all going to be in heaven, right? They're, they're, you know, they're Jacob of all people, but, you know, not a very good thing to do, Jacob, to, you know, demonstrate that favoritism. We talked about that. What do you think about this? And you think that's a good thing? How would you like a five favor? And they're like, no. So just allowing that discussion. And I think the parting thing is remembering that Jesus spoke in those parables. He was always telling the stories. He was always giving those analogies that, that were relatable to the audience. And, um, you know, I just, again, giving pause, giving meditation, the thinking, the speaking, right, and memorization, and then the stories, which bring out the emotion and the passion. So, hey, um, we're going to go to a pause at this point in time and share some resources with uh, the listeners, and we're going to be back shortly with uh, uh, some, some guests that are going to be on, on the call. So uh, uh, we'll be right back. If you are in a position where you're caring for teens and preteens, whether that means parenting them or grandparenting them, perhaps you just have a desire to minister to teens, you'll probably notice really quickly that you don't understand a lot about their world, from the music they listen to, to the apps they're always on, to the words that, that they use. It's really difficult to know where to start. Well, our resource this week is going to help you put at least one foot into their world. This is another resource from Axis, and this one is delivered to your email every Friday. It's called the Culture Translator, and its goal is to translate culture, translate the world of teens so that anyone can understand the things that they are experiencing. If you have any contact with teenagers, or even if your kids are young, this is an extremely valuable tool in helping you understand more about their world. The more that you know where they are in life, the better chance that you'll have at reaching them with the truth. You can find the link in the show notes for the Culture Translator and get signed up. I hope you find it to be as much of a blessing as I have. Now, let's get back to the show. All right, welcome back. We're here with Jason and Stephanie Cancino, and uh, we're excited. This is our first couple that we've had on. It's always been just... Um, just one partner and so we'll have the insight of both of you together and there'll be less inclination for you to um uh i guess bend to the truth would be a, a good way because you'd be able to keep each other accountable and um none of our guests do that i'm just kidding um and so let's let's take a moment and just have you guys introduce yourself um just the d dynamics of your family uh, anything that would be helpful to get people to understand um, where you're coming from and how you're parenting and all those kind of things. My name is Jason Cancino. Um, April 1st, we will be married two years. We have a blended family of four children, ages 11, 11, 12, and 14. Uh, I'm Steph Cancino, and I have, between the four children, three are his, and then one is mine. I'll tell you, that's an interesting combination of ages for sure. Wow. So I really look forward to some of your answers. Um, if we've waited a few months, they would have been 11, 12, 13, and 14. For six months, they're all consecutive. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with respect to the, the co-parenting, right, and, and, and the blended family, 
what are some challenges that you've come across and maybe some of the things you've tried to address uh, with some of those challenges that you could care to share with us? Of course, they're all their own little human. So uh, they all have different needs, different wants, and often bump heads. The biggest challenge, I believe, was uh, making sure we were on the same page. The kids often um, have a little trickery and will go to one parent. If they don't like the answer, go to another. And uh, they, they fish for what they want. But we often, uh, well, I personally have decided I don't like to answer questions unless we've discussed it and uh, make sure we're on the same page. And that, that has actually helped out a lot. Um, just the kids knowing we're a team and that we agree with each other. Have you guys experienced um, just the relationship because you guys, you guys were, were both um, parenting separately and then you kind of blended your family together. How, did you notice that there were any like changes in how you related with um, your biological child before and then after the marriage? Like, was, the, was there any kind of changes that, that you guys experienced? And um, maybe what did that look like? And how did you navigate that? Yeah, I, Tracy and I had, I mean, we've, our relationship has changed, not for the worst, just different. Um, I guess it was a little bit different for me because it was just me and Tracy. So like we spent all of our time together and we like even have to go to the grocery store. She would come with me. She just did everything. She'd come to work with me because I couldn't leave her home by herself. Um, so when we blended our family, we didn't get nearly as much one-on-one -on -one time. Um, but we get a lot of family time and she, and we were, I'm still intentional about trying to spend time with her one-on-one, -on -one, even if it's just in a room or at home, whatever it is. Um, and then the challenge of back to the, the other question, I would say trying to treat all of the kids equally, even though you're connected to your own child, you know, biologically, like God designed each of us to love our biological kids in a way that only we can, but then trying to duplicate that love to another child that's not your blood, it's just a different kind of love. And to make sure that it comes across equally the same way, that's a challenge. Not that you love one more, or it's just, it's different because God created it differently. Is this is this in something that you say, or you know, can you be more specific? How do you how do you make sure that 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 His children are of of an equal agape love um, that you would have for your own daughter? I mean, I still struggle with it, <laughs> and. I mean, I think he does too. Just we have, you tend to have more grace with your own kids, like biological kids, because like you're just, you've had them forever, you know? And the, the little ticks and nuances about them, you're used to it. Um, so you can kind of let those slide a little bit easier than you can with a child that you're not biologically connected to. Um, but as far as like real life, how do you do it? intentionally being equal across the board, like even small things, like if I'm at the grocery store and I pick up something for Tracy, I pick up something for the other kids. And Tracy does the same thing. Like if he goes and picks up something for his kids, he'll make sure, even if Tracy's not there, even if she's at her dad's, like he'll bring her something home. So when she comes back, he's like, oh, we did this, but I wanted to make sure you got one too. Just so they see that even when they're not there, like we're still thinking about them. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. You talk about the, the nuances and little ticks. And it's funny because you all jumped into this at a season when like all of your kids are in like preteen teen age when like all of those ticks and quirks are like magnitude. So, so it's making it even more complex. And so I think that, um, I think that you all probably had just jumped into it at a, a really, um, just interesting time in in their development and, and trying to to get all of those and I think they'll probably eventually get to a point where they level out a little bit and it's a little bit easier um, on you to do those things you know uh, you, you 
You've, so it sounds like you're doing a really good job of preventing them from doing the divide and conquer, right? So you make sure that you, you guys have a mutual discussion between the two of you and you give a, a single answer, yes or no to all of them. So that's, that's a really great tactic. Um, you know, definitely dispersing to the best of your ability. Uh, and that always sounds like it's a work in progress, right? To provide that equity across, make sure that they're all feeling loved. How, how have you helped foster their ability to get along with each other? <laughs> I see some smile. Uh -oh. You force them. You're forced to love your you sister. You force them. <laughs> There's no That's other great. option. <laughs> All right. I mean, honestly, instilling that this is their family. And um, that is important. And they were a big part in the beginning as well. We sat down and spoke with them and let them know what, you know, we wanted to get married and we wanted to blend these families. And they were included in that. And thank God they were all for it. And I, I couldn't imagine if we would have actually hit that wall right there, but everybody seemed on board. So being willing to go forward as a family, I mean, that, that was a big part. I think that and intentionally telling them like back to the it's really hard to not to for them to not see their house divided just because they do have different parents and so when it comes down to it well this is my mom and this is my dad you know um but like i can think back on times where we've maybe called them down or talked to them about something and you know you're not going to treat your sister that way even though it's a stepsister like we don't say stepsister you know, no, this is your brother. You're going to treat him with love. To like verbally make them understand that this is a family where we're one unit. Yeah, we've got different bloodlines running through. Um, but and 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 I've seen it, they refer to themselves as siblings. Like they don't say, Oh, my stepsister. It's oh, my sister's not at school today because she's sick, even though you know it's not her blood sister. And they do the same thing with me, like. Tracy calls him dad. Sometimes his kids call me mom. Sometimes they call us by their first names. You know, it's Tracy calls me Steph, my own kid. <laughs> well, yeah, there's, I mean, there's lots, there's lots there that I think are, are super intriguing. And I think that it can be super challenging. I think that one of the, one of the best ways, um, and, you know, I guess this is more, this is more in the advice realm that just came in and question per se is, you know, we, we talk a lot about the, how the relationship between the couple kind of sets the, the standard and how I, how I can imagine how, how difficult it, it must have been to have these relationships with your kids that have formed for years and years and years, and then you have to get to a point where, okay, well, you're married, and then, you know, in, in the the standard of the family and how God instituted, like you all now become the most important person in each other's life, and it's it's, I imagine it was difficult making that, um, making that transition happen with you know this is the most important person because that is going to then set the standard for everything else that happens for you and um you know i've just just seen your your family from um the exterior and just hearing about different uh things that uh that you guys participate in and, and how you guys are in in investing in their uh, spiritual lives. I'm curious if you had any like specific examples of things that that you guys do to kind of help instill spiritual principles in in your kids and um, and then you know how that works in your family. Steph's actually pretty amazing in that category. She, she teaches at home as well. She likes to really form these strategic studies we did try just reading through the bible together it we'd let everybody read a chapter that didn't always go so well sometimes i think it would last a little too long wouldn't hold their attention so then sometimes she'd print off studies for families and that seemed to be a little more children oriented it would definitely grab their attention i think another 
thing was is just really letting them know that yeah you know she might not be your biological mother but anything she says is as good as coming out of my mouth and that that seemed to really hit a key that seemed to kind of get some some of them in line a little better because they did they were a little hesitant in the beginning that takes work that takes i mean it's it's almost like and it's hard because when when the kids are are in middle school high schoolish age they're looking for any any crack in the armor any any chance that they have to take it advantage of of um I mean, I'm not saying that your kids specifically, this is all kids, all kids are looking for, for those opportunities to, and so I can imagine it takes a lot of hard work to, uh, to make sure that happens. Um, and so you talk about like specific things, um, Steph, I'm curious if there's any like specific thing that, that maybe, uh, recently that you've enjoyed most that you felt the, the kids really responded to that you felt like, you know how sometimes like as a teacher, you know, when something like lands, like when they, when they actually get it, have you had any of those moments recently where, you know, you think something that, Oh, I worked at something and I feel like it actually, like there was relevance there. Like they actually responded. Has that ever, has that ever happened? <laughs> Tell me about these. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah. So uh, what well, did start, I have not done them for a while. Um, actually the kids just asked me the other day when we were going to do Bible study again. Um, so yeah, I did start doing a weekly Bible study with them and I started, um, just with really basic stuff with like a, a biblical worldview. And so the first lesson was who is God? Because if they don't know who God is, or if they see God as a tyrant or a rule maker, then everything else is going to be wrong in their spiritual life. And so we started with very simple things. And then like, who am I, who did God create me to be, who, who does he expect me to be things like that. Um, but my, like, one moment that I'm probably never going to forget is we did a study on the difference between religion and Jesus. And there's this, um, you might know him. His name is Jeff Bethke. I don't know how to say his last name. Um, but he's a really popular Bible teacher and he has, he does like slam spoken word. It's, it's really neat. But anyway, I found this video and it's called Jesus is greater than religion. And my whole goal was to teach them that religion is not, or, being a follower of Jesus is not about following rules. It's not about ticking off the 10 commandments. Like, no, I haven't lied today. I haven't killed anybody. You know, it was more about really just following and having this relationship with Jesus. And this video is this guy explaining it. And he's really bold, really like unfiltered. And I mean, he talks about how, you know, people are hypocrites and, you know, you're going to church and you're worshiping and then you're shunning a prostitute on the street because they're not good enough or, um, you I've know, seen this guy. Yes. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. And the kids like, and I thought, because I mean, like he talks about people watching pornography and people getting pregnant outside of wedlock. And I mean, like these like pretty deep issues and a very surface level. I mean, he just kind of hits them. But he the whole goal of the video is that like we're all children of God. We're all called to love these people. And it's not oh, I'm on this level because I go to church and I was raised in a Christian home and you're down here because you're struggling with this addiction or, you know, you're, you're, you're out of the church or whatever it may be. And he ends up saying, this is the reason I hate religion, but I love Jesus. And the kids like just grabbed onto it. They wanted me to play it over and over and over again. Justice and Tracy were like, I need you to email it to me. I'm going to show it to my friends at school. And they were walking around the house and they were like, I hate religion. And I was like, okay, so that's great. But I was like, you can't just like go to school or go to church and be like, I hate religion. Like you've got a bad like, But they let, like, it was their, it was their ground breaking moment of the difference and just being this church goer and, oh, I've been raised a Christian. I've been in church my whole life. This is what we do versus this is what a follower of Jesus does. And this is where my heart should be toward other people. So that was like my one groundbreaking moment. The rest of the Bible study. Like, eh. <laughs> well, you know, you're, 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 when you go back to, to play the, the final published work of this, you're going to be kind of amazed at what you just said was sort of the, the meat and potatoes of what Jeff and I were having a discord and, and a discussion about. And, um, you know, it was about, you know, deploying disciplines, godly spiritual disciplines, like reading the Bible or doing devotions, but going beyond 
the, the doing them just for the sake of doing them, but trying to figure out a way of how we can get to the heart of, of, of the listener or the children that are partaking in these things. And, uh, and it just sounds like, you know, you, you struck a chord. And, you know, I, part of our earlier discussion, too, was, you know, not getting discouraged if you're trying things. And, and what I really like is how, okay, you tried a reading through the Bible, didn't work. You didn't tank and stopped trying. You you shifted and looked for other avenues, whether other resources. And to me, that's 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 the perfect story. Um, as we kind of bring this around to a close, any parting pearls of wisdom or advice you'd like to to bring? You, you've shared a lot already. Anything else you'd like to to share with the, the listeners? Uh, well, first, I would like to be known that Jesus that Jesus that Jason. <laughs> does teach too um he's like every kind of went on me like i do plan the studies um but he's really good about just weaving jesus and weaving the bible into everyday conversation so if something happens at school and they're having a conversation he can very easily weave the gospel into that or like bring up you know well this is what happened you know to remember the story in the bible or i mean even if I don't know, they compliment something or whatever it is, like he can be like, oh, you know, that was all God, you know, just really making that a normal part of your conversation in the home, I think is really important. I think another thing that might be important is to lower expectations. You're asking a lot for your children to accept. And I feel as parents, you need to be pretty open as well. And Bible studies might not go as well as you thought they might. Maybe the children might not walk away with what you thought they were going to, but you just keep pushing at it. Well, and just know that God's word doesn't return void. So it's not like you're doing it in vain. Like, yeah, maybe none of the kids paid attention for the 30 minutes of Bible study, but there's there's something that's in there. Like God's not gonna just leave you hanging and be like, oh yeah, you taught all this and no nothing's gonna stick ever. The seed. Yeah. Well, and I think, yeah, and I think that one of the things that makes what you described Jason doing well and bringing those things up during the day, it's, it's, you almost need to have a, a basis. I mean, you need to be, oh, if you, rem you remember when the Bible says this, well, if they've never navigated through that, there's no way that they can possibly remember it. And so if you're able to, to point it back to something that they um, heard at some point, I think it's, it, it, it's helpful in having those daily interactions. And um, so, hey, Steph, Jason, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I hope the listeners got to um, just have some insight into how uh, families that uh, maybe are very similar to, to them or maybe very different than them um, kind of function and how make it all work uh, all for the glory of God. And so we're thankful for all of you joining us and we will see you next time. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Through the Forest. We hope it was a blessing to you. We'd be really grateful if you like and subscribe to our channel. And if you know someone who would be encouraged by this episode, please pass it along. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.